good morning. Happy Easter to you. I want to begin by sharing a lighthearted story with you, and it goes like this. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I, asked, I was asked by a funeral director to play at a graveside service for a homeless man. The departed had no family and no friends, and the service was to be at a pauper's cemetery in rural Kentucky. I was not familiar with the backwoods and got lost, and being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral workers were gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. Only the diggers and their equipment remained, and the men were eating lunch in the shade of a nearby tree. I felt bad about being late for the ceremony, and I apologized to the workers. I went to the side of the grave and looked down and saw that the vault lid was already in place. I didn't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and gathered round with their hard hats in hand. I played my heart and soul out for that man with no family and no friends. I played for that homeless land like I'd never played for anyone before. I played Amazing Grace, and as I played, the workers began to weep. They wept, I wept, and we all wept together. But when I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the doors to my car, I heard one of the workers say, I haven't heard anything like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> now, I share that story. Some of you are like, I don't get it. But those of you that do get it, here's why I share that story. Because there's nothing quite like being out of touch with what is going on around you. There's nothing quite like, like, like not really knowing what is actually going on. And my, uh, my experience is this is what Easter is sometimes like. Like, I'll, you know, if you're here today, you're likely know that it has something to do with Jesus, but you're not actually sure why he actually came. And so here, my hope this morning is this. I'm not trying to convince anybody that Jesus is who he said he was. I'm not trying to make you believe in Jesus. But in my experience, one of, if not the biggest reason that people reject Jesus is not because they don't like something he said, or it's not because they don't like something about him. It's because they don't actually know who he was and what he came to do. Uh, we hear about Jesus from the news or from what somebody said or what somebody thought, but we've never actually took any time to read the Gospels for ourselves and see that Jesus actually claimed to be God, actually claimed to make a way for us to have a relationship with God and to forgive us of our sins. And so what I want us to do this morning is I want us to look at why Jesus actually came. Why did Jesus actually come? And so if you, uh, that's the question we're looking at. So if you have a Bible, uh, go, to, excuse me, go ahead and open to Hebrews chapter 10. As we look at this question, if you don't have a Bible, there's a black one somewhere around you. It'll be on page 1066 in that one. And if you do not own a Bible, we would love for you to take that one home, uh, as that is our gift to you. Now, the book of Hebrews is the only book in the New Testament where we're not sure who actually wrote the book. Uh, but the chapters leading up to chapter 10 that we're going to read this morning uh, is all about Jesus and the Messiah and what he would come to do. And so here's what it says, Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1 says this, since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the reality itself of those things, it can never perfect the worshipers by the same sacrifices they continually offer year after year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered, uh, offered since the worshipers purified once and for all would no longer have any consciousness of sin. Here's what's going on here. The law, if you're familiar, maybe you're not, is the Old Testament law uh, for the Israelites as God took them out of Egypt and gave them the promised land. He said, I want you to follow these laws. I want you to do this so you, so you can represent the world, uh, represent me to the world. And when you sin, when you fall short, there were, sac there were sacrifices that they had to perform. But as the the, the writer here says they could not perfect the worshipers because they always had to perform them day, month, year after year. If you were a priest, honestly, you would spend some days, all you would do the entire day is perform sacrifices. And so what this writer is saying here is that this was a shadow of what was to come, that this was not always going to be this way, that God was going to make it possible for one day for the sacrifices to cease. And so he says this in verse three, but in, but in the sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. Year. Again, it reminds us that we fall short, that we do not have it all together. And so God is going to make a way for us to actually be able to receive the goodness and grace of himself. Verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. In other words, these animal sacrifices symbolized the payment of sin. They did not actually accomplish the payment of sin, but they symbolized it. And animals couldn't do that. In other words, we need something else or somebody else to actually actually on our behalf, once and for all, take away the sin and shame that we have all committed. And so here's what I want us to do, or want us to know this morning as we begin, as we look at this question, why did Jesus come? Here's what I want us to know, that God has made a way 
for you to be fully loved and accepted by him. Now hear me. God has done it, not you. So in other words, God is not asking us to do a lot of things, to try really hard, and then maybe he'll meet us halfway for really good people. But instead, what we see is that we could not do it ourselves, And so God has made a way for us to be fully loved and accepted by him. Not partially, okay? Not if we do certain things and try really hard and not do other things, then maybe if we're good enough, we'll make it. Not partially, not if we do certain things. He has made a way once and for all for us to be loved and accepted by him. Which means no matter what you brought in here this morning, no matter what you may be dealing with, we need to know that God loves you and God cares for you. He has made a way for us to be loved and accepted by him. And so let's continue Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. He then says this, the writer says this, Therefore, as he, talking about Jesus the Messiah, was coming into the world, he said, and he's going to quote a passage from the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, You did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. You did not delight in the whole burnt offerings and sin offerings. Then I said, see, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. In other words, what's happening here is that this was a prophecy of the Messiah to come, to do the once and for all, to do for us what these animal sacrifices could not do. And notice it says that this is God's will. Now, if you have some sort of familiarity with Christianity, a lot of people view, view Scripture like this. In the Old Testament, God is angry and vengeful and mean and not happy about anything or anybody. In the New Testament, with Jesus, God is loving and, and cares about people and is forgiving, and they're two different gods. Now, what I would say to that is, number one, you can't actually read the Old Testament and make that claim. What you see over and over and over again is that God is continually forgiving his people, giving grace and mercy. Oh, we did a series through the Old Testament book of Judges about a year and a half ago, and we saw that at one point the, the, the Israelites stopped even asking for forgiveness, and yet God was forgiving them anyway. What we see over and over again is that God is a forgiving and loving God, and it was God the Father's will to send God the Son to make it possible for us to be loved and forgiven by him. Be loved and forgiven by him. And so it continues in verse 8 by saying this, kind of interpreting this passage. It says, After he says above, you do not desire or delight in sacrifices and offerings, whole burnt offerings and sin offerings, which again were offered according to the law. He then says, See, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first to establish the second. In other words, that God did not desire animal sacrifices because they had some intrinsic value. But we do see that God does value and love intrinsically this final sacrifice, this Messiah, this Jesus, to take away the needs of the world. So again, I just want to make this clear this morning, that contrary to what you may think, God loves you. No matter what you have done, no matter what you will do, no matter what you may be dealing with right now, I don't know what, you may, why, what, what brought you here today, what you may be going with, no matter what you're dealing through, you need to know that God loves you that God loves you. And so here is why we need to know that God has made a way, not us, but God has made a way for us to be fully loved and accepted by him. Here's why. Because God doesn't need your sacrifices. Listen, God does not need us. He does not need anything from us. He is holy, just, uh, perfect, uh, joyful, and in, complete in and of himself. And yet, because he loves us, that is why he sent a Messiah to come. So he does not need your sacrifices. Now, obviously, we don't do kind of a modern sacrificial system anymore, but we do have kind of modern sacrifices. So it could be maybe, you know, you're going to go to church more, or maybe you're going to read your Bible more, you're going to pray more, you're going to be more generous, or you're going to help an old lady across the street. Like all these things that we do, we kind of store up and we kind of think, okay, if I do this, then God will owe me. If I do this, then God will be indebted, right? So you, uh, your, God does not need your sacrifices. We think that God needs something from us, and so we have to act a certain way in order for him to love us and forgive us. That God does not need your sacrifices, and this is good news. You want to know why? Because your sacrifices aren't enough. They're not enough anyway. So I'll give you some examples. In scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah, who was a prophet, uh, said that our sacrifices were like filthy rags, or our good works are like filthy rags. Uh, Paul in the New Testament, he says that it's like dung. Like we think we're awesome. We think we do all these things, but reality compared to God's goodness, they're nothing compared to him, that our sacrifices aren't enough. Let me give you an example, maybe to give you a modern example to show you what I mean by this. Uh, our four-year-old daughter, Finley, uh, let's say, now she doesn't know what Disney World is, so let me caveat, do not tell her. Uh, but let's say she figures it out one day. And so she comes to me and she says, hey, dad, I want you to take me to Disney World. 
And if you take, if you dis, if you uh, agree to take me to Disney World, I'll do some sacrifices. I'll do some things to make it uh, to 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 make it possible for you to take me. So I'll make my bed every day, and I'll clean the dishes after dinner, and I'll play nice with Roman, our one year old, and I'll share with him, and I'll always use my manners, and I'll listen the first time, and I'll do all these things, right? And if I do that, then you'll take me to Disney World. Now, here's what we know. As awesome as that is, and as much as I would love her to do those things, that ain't going to help me pay for the trip to Disney World, right? Nothing she's going to do is going to make that affordable or make it easier to happen, right? And so let's say out of the kindness and goodness of my heart, I decide to take Finley to Disney World. You would not look at me and not look at Finley and say, well, Finley deserved it. If I did that, you would look at me and you would say, what a generous and loving dad that he would pay and make it possible to take his daughter to Disney World. Like, we know that that's true. We know there's nothing Finley could do to, to help make the payment possible. And yet, this is the exact opposite way of how we view God. We go around thinking, well, I've done good today. I haven't done anything wrong. So God, you owe me. I do my part. You do your part. And together, we can be awesome together, right? Well, we need to know that's not how it works. God is perfect and righteous and just. He does not need anything from you. He does not need anything from me, which is good because our sacrifices aren't enough anyway. And because that is true, here's what he does. Verse 10, by this will, this desire to give us love and forgiveness and perfection, by this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So again, these sacrifices that these priests uh, gave, uh, they forgave, but they didn't actually take away sins. And so instead, this is what we celebrate about Easter, that Jesus came to live the perfect life we could not live, live so that anyone who trusts and follows in him can receive the grace and mercy of Christ, not because we are awesome, but because of what Christ has done for us. And this was a very big deal, if you were a first century Jew, that Jesus would come and then would sit down because a priest again priests did not sit down their entire job day after day was to offer sacrifices and so for God to say no I have made a way for it to be completed once and for all is a really big deal now hear me this does not mean that God doesn't care about our sins it does not mean that his, our sins do not matter they matter so much that he wants to deal with them and he deals with them by doing for us what we could not do for ourselves and so this is what this means that Jesus is the sacrifice not you trying really hard, not you being a really good person, not you reading your Bible more, giving more, or coming to church more. It is Jesus. In fact, here's what it says uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, Paul says this. He says this, that he made the one, so God made the one who did not know sin, which is Jesus, to be sin for us. So that in him, not in our trying really hard, not in us uh, being buddy-buddy with God, and then if we do good, he kind of says, oh, it's okay, I'll help you out. No, it's in him, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That the God would look at us the same way he looks at Jesus as perfect and righteous and holy and good, not because of us, but because of him. That is why we celebrate Jesus' coming. And so if that's true, if Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, here's what we need to do with this. Here's what we need to do with this text. Here's what we need to do with Easter. Here's what we need to do with Jesus. That we need to see Jesus for who he is, not who you think he may be. That you and I need to see Jesus for who he actually is, not who we think we, he may be. Again, this is to me, in my experience as a pastor, talking to Jesus about Jesus a lot with people, is that one of the biggest reasons people miss out on Jesus is because they don't actually know who he is. They just kind of assume, like our culture says about God, that if we try really hard, that God will forgive us. That if we're a good person, that God will love us. And what we don't understand is that Jesus came not to be a moral person, not to be an example of how to live, although he is those things. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, that Jesus claimed to be God, claim to be the only way to salvation, and claim to have the ability to forgive sins. And again, my goal this morning is not to convince you that that's true. I just want you to know that if you decide to reject Jesus, you know what you're actually rejecting, that you're walking away from the grace and mercy of God. We need to see him for who he is, not who we think he may be. And let me give you an example of why this is important, why it's important for us to know something and not just think about it, but be wrong. Uh, a few months ago, I was leaving the YMCA. That's where these muscles are made. And uh, we've got two kids, Finley, who's four, Roman, who just turned one was a few months ago. And it was cold. It was raining. And I had my, my gym bag and, and uh, Finley's, or the Roman's diaper bag. And so we're going to the car, and, like, you know, it's raining. We're trying to get in there. I put Finley in. I'm getting Roman in there. And there's this car, like, waiting for me to 
finish so he could take my spot. And I'm like, listen, I'm not super mom here. It's going to take me some time, right? So I'm trying to get him in there, but I'm feeling all this pressure because they're sitting there. And I'm like, come on, don't sit there. But anyway, so I'm getting, getting there. They get in the car. Everything seems to be good. Everything's good. So we're driving home. We're about 10 or 12 minutes away. And let me just caveat this by saying, I love my kids. This was an accident. And if you're a parent, you have done this. If you're not a parent, you will do this. So don't get me in trouble, okay? I'm trusting you this morning. I'm driving home. We're about 30 seconds away from our neighborhood. Uh, I was turning onto a road. It's about a one. It's a run, one lane road that leads into our neighborhood. About 30 seconds away. All of a sudden, Finley says, "Hey, Dad, Roman unbuckled himself and he's standing up." And I'm thinking, "That's not possible." So I turn around and I see this. <laughs> Obviously, I pulled over. Okay, I was not like selfie. No, this is pulled over before I took this picture. Okay, here's the deal. I had no idea he wasn't buckled. Now, he was probably the happiest I have ever seen him. Like, he was like, yeah, he was smiling. He was, and I'm like, trying to make sure he doesn't fall, like, turn over. Here's the thing. I thought Roman was buckled. And because I thought he was buckled, we drove home like there was no problems. See, I thought something that wasn't true. And my fear for some of you is that you're not, you're rejecting Jesus, not because you don't like Jesus or you might not like what he has to say, but you don't know what he has to say. And listen, that is okay. That is not a shameful thing. That's not thing, something for you and I to feel guilty over. We just want to make aware to all of us who Jesus actually is. Uh, my hope and prayer is that you and I would see Jesus for who he is, not who we think he may be. And you may be saying, okay, I see it. I get it. Jesus says he's God. He came to forgive our sins. He came to defeat death. That's why we're celebrating Easter, that he rose again. I'm not sure I believe that that's true, and that's an okay starting point. But I just want you to know who Jesus actually claimed to be so that you and I do not walk through life, that you and I don't drive through life missing out on something that could completely change our life because we think something that isn't true. I want you and I to see him for who he is, not who we think he may be. And here is why this is important for us to do. Here's why it's important for us to see Jesus for who he is, not who we think he may be. Because a misunderstanding of Jesus will lead to a misunderstanding or misinteraction with God. A misunderstanding of Jesus and who he is will lead to a misinteraction with God. So again, if you think God is a vengeful God, he gets mad at you very easily, and if you mess up, then he needs a, a period of cooling off before you can talk to him again and pray for him again, whatever, that'll change how you interact with him, right? That if you don't understand that he came in spite of your sins, because of your sins, to love you and give you grace, if you don't understand that, it will lead to a misinteraction of him or with him, and you will go your entire life missing out on what God has for you. You'll go your entire life when things are hard and when things are difficult, missing out on the love and grace of God, even in the midst of difficulties, because you've misunderstood who he is. A misunderstanding of God, leads, or of Jesus, leads to a misinteraction with God. Let me give you some lighthearted examples of how what happens when we misunderstand each other, right? One of my favorite stories is Christine and I, are our first year of marriage, we were living in an apartment. Uh, I was sitting in the living room watching TV or reading a book or, or something, and she was in the kitchen, and you can't see the kitchen from the living room. What you need to understand is when we got married, Christina like wanted to learn how to cook stuff. And so she would often yell in the kitchen because things weren't working. Like she, and so it became like a, a normal occurrence. And so I'm sitting there doing whatever. And all of a sudden I hear Christina yelling in the kitchen. So what do I do? Nothing. Why would I do anything? Because I don't know how to do it. She don't know how to do it. She'll figure it out. <laughs> After a few minutes, Christina comes into the living room mad. And she said, Dylan, why didn't you come to the kitchen? I said, because you always yell in the kitchen. She had started a little fire in our kitchen. <laughs> now, luckily, she was able to put it out on her own, but because I didn't understand the situation, I didn't help. And that's probably a good thing, right? And so she, that's, I'll give you, I'll give you another example of this. Probably a couple years later, uh, we were hanging out with some people, maybe, maybe the next year, I don't know. And Christina was complaining about how I'm a very plain or a picky eater, which is not true. I'll eat anything. I may not like it, but I'll eat it. And so somebody said, well, how, what about chicken salad? Like, what if you made a bunch of chicken salad and you guys could, like, eat it for lunches? It'll be inexpensive, all sort of thing. And Christina's like, chicken, Dylan is not like, she's not going to like chicken salad. He doesn't like chicken salad. And I was like, yeah, who doesn't like chicken salad? Like, give me some chicken salad. I'll eat it. And so she goes home and she starts making, she makes this massive Tupperware of chicken salad. And so I walk into the kitchen and I say, what's that? And she says, it's chicken salad. And I said, no, it's not. And she says, yes, it is. I was like, what is this? I was chicken salad. Of course, that's gross. What I thought about chicken salad was chicken on a salad, right? And who doesn't like chicken on a salad? I'm like, yeah, I'll eat that. That's good, right? Because I didn't understand what they were talking about. She did all this stuff for no reason. She had chicken salad for a month, and it was awesome. It was awesome. I'll give you one more. Okay, I'll just give you one more. Uh, one of our dear friends, Rachel, 
uh, one of our good friends from college, one of Christina's best friends, uh, she studied abroad one semester in Ecuador, and she met herself an Ecuadorian man, and so they ended up getting married. Now, she speaks English as her primary language. She's also fluent in Spanish, and her husband, Felipe, is, you know, Spanish is his first language, but he's also fluent in English, and so even, even with that, though, there was still some miscommunication at times. You know, words get lost in translation. There's not always a word in English or Spanish that means that exact thing. And so early on in their marriage, probably the first year or two, they're walking around. I think they were in Chile, where they live, and uh, it was hot outside. And so Rachel looks at Felipe, and she's upset. She goes, why are all these women not wearing many clothes? Or whatever she said. I didn't say it. She did, so don't get mad at me. <laughs> but she was basically upset with the lack of clothing these women were wearing. And so she's upset. So she says to Felipe, why are they not wearing their clothes? And Felipe turns to her, and he says, it's because they are hot. Now, there was uh, some misunderstanding of what went on there, which led to a big fight. Uh, Rachel thought Felipe was saying that they're hot, they're good looking, so of course they shouldn't wear a lot of clothes. Like, they're hot. What he was actually saying is it is hot outside, which is why they were wearing not enough clothes. So again, a misunderstanding led to an interaction that wasn't pleasant, right? Now, again, those are fun. Those are lighthearted. But when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to God, here's, again, why we need to know why Jesus actually came. Because if you misunderstand who Jesus was or what he came to do, you will miss, uh, miss out with who God is and what God has for you. And because Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, because Easter is a celebration that Jesus actually defeated sin and death, that he rose from the dead, it's not some fictional story that we, don't, that we don't gather on Sundays to pat ourselves on the back and say, life's hard, let's just have a pep talk. We gather because of what happened in Easter about 2,000 years ago. Because it's true, here's what the author says, the last part of Hebrews that I'll read this morning, verse 13. He says, he, talking about Jesus, is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Again, those who are following of Je followers of Jesus because of what he did on the cross. Forever we can receive the grace and mercy of God, not because we try real hard, but because of what Jesus did for us. Verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For after he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, the Lord says. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And I will never again remember their sins and their lawless acts. Now where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering of sin. Now hear me. God is not saying our sin doesn't matter. God is not saying I'm not going to deal with it. He said I'm going to choose to not remember it because Jesus is going to take it. In other words, it still matters what we do and how we live. But because of what Jesus has done for us, there is grace and mercy. There is grace and mercy for us, not because of us, but because of him. Again, this is why Jesus came, to give for, do for us, to give us life that we could not just, uh, we could never have on our own. And here's the thing, that yes, this has eternal implications, but it also has implications for our lives today. That in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of things not going as we want them to go, we know that whatever the reason is for why certain things happen, it's not because Jesus doesn't care. Because if Jesus and God did not care, Jesus would not have come. This is why he came, to give us grace, forgiveness, and mercy, no matter who you are, no matter what you may do. And so here's what I want us to take away this morning from this text, uh, from today, and from Easter, and why Jesus actually came. Here's why he came. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. He did not come for the people who only do bad things sometimes, and then with Jesus' uh, uh, sacrifice on the cross, then they're good. He came for dead people who were far from him, every single one of us, so that anyone who places their faith and trust in Jesus, well, Jesus will be the one that changes our life. Jesus will be the one that does for us what we could not, what we cannot, what we could never do for ourselves. This is why Jesus came. He didn't come to be our buddy. He didn't come to be our friend when things aren't going wrong. He didn't come to like help us out when we, when we feel bad. He came to be our king because he is the king who loves us so much that he came not because he needed us, but because he wanted us. And so that anybody, no matter who you are, can choose to follow Jesus and experience how Jesus will change your life. This is why Jesus came. And so what I want to do is I want to take a second. I want us to see someone from our own church who has experienced the life that Jesus offers, not behavior modification, but life. So turn your attention to the screen. Hi, uh, my name is Martin, Martin McCorkle. 
My father noticed when I was very young that um, I wasn't developing right, that I couldn't walk right. and It took uh, many years for people to find out what I had, and when they did, they diagnosed me with Charcot-Marie Tooth, which is a peripheral neuropathy, which means the ends of my arms and the ends of my legs um, do not get nerve conduction to the muscles. The muscles are fine, they just don't get signals. And because they don't get signals, they slowly atrophy. There is no treatment for this. You just get a little worse day after day, uh, no matter what you do. And uh, despite the fact that I have CMT, I was still able to hike and do many, many things that uh, were very difficult physically. You know, I was coming out of high school and getting ready to go to college. I, uh, I started to love the mountains and I loved them so much. I was going to the mountains all the time anyway. I moved to Yosemite where I could work and hike, climb. And that whole part of my life culminated in 1982 when I walked 1,200 miles along the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico about two thirds of the way through California. While I was on this trail, my best friend wound up with my ex-girlfriend. And even though I confessed to love those people, I, I hated them. And I hated them so much on one particular day. I will never forget this. I, I wanted to kill them. And I wanted to kill them with such passion that I got out my trail guide and started to look for cliffs that I could push them off. And as I stayed on the trail and tried to work through this, I, what's wrong with me? Why? This is not right. I didn't know how to frame it, but I just knew something in me was bent. I went back to Yosemite because I had really nowhere else to go. And I was sitting around one day and a woman asked me to a Bible study. So I went and I heard the gospel and it made complete sense. I was messed up. I, I didn't need to be helped. I didn't need to be taught. I needed to be changed. I needed to be saved. And that night went home, got into my bed. The, guy who led the Bible study had given me some books and I read them. And then right before I went to sleep, I just couldn't fight anymore. So all I said to God was, okay, I'm yours, I'm in, let's go. I woke up the next morning a different man. I love people now, and I didn't used to. I love to forgive people, and that's all because Christ changed me. Christ taught me how to do these things. I can't imagine living life with the kind of anger I used to have in my soul. I, uh, I, it terrifies me to think about that. Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. The fact that I went from a person who did not know God to knowing my Savior, and that I someday, someday, uh, will walk with a new body is a very, very, very motivating thing to me, and I'm very thankful for that future. God changes us. Not in that he makes us somebody we weren't supposed to be, but that he redeems us to be who we were supposed to be. And that he has changed me so deeply that I was once a man who my natural impulses were violent. And now my natural impulses are to love. That doesn't mean we're perfect. But redemption is so much greater than mere forgiveness of sins. He is literally making us new. And so that's, that's what we celebrate, that Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. 
He came for those of us that were dead, all of us that were dead, to make dead people live. And so what I want to do real quick is I want to read one more passage. It'll be Ephesians chapter 2. It'll be on the screen. Uh, This is the Apostle Paul. Here's what he says, talking about this very truth. He says this, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previous lived, according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. Verse 4. There we go. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though you were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. You're not saved by trying hard. You're not saved by doing all the right things or saying all the right things. Or all, You're saved by grace. And so again, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. And that is the invitation for all of us. And so maybe you're here this morning and you are a follower of Christ. Maybe you and I just need to be reminded as we do every single day that it's not about our work. It's not about us trying hard. It's about following Jesus and Jesus will change our life. And when we blow it, when we screw up, we don't have to run and hide, but we can go right back to him because he loves us. And if you're here this morning, whatever reason you came, maybe you were invited or drugged or you just thought maybe it's Easter and so I came. Drug here, not drugged. However you came. (laughs) You need to know this. Even if you came here and you're on drugs, that's fine. You need to know this, that God loves you in the midst of it. That, that you and I are dead. That you and, no, it's, not about us, only God, it's not about God coming for the people that were good enough and he puts us over the edge. None of us are good enough. All of us are dead. And dead things cannot do anything in and of themselves to make them grow. The good news is that Jesus defeated death and sin so that anybody, no matter what we may be involved in, no matter what we have done or will do, can experience the grace and love of Jesus in the midst of it that we can trust him in the midst of it. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing one more song. And my invitation is this, that maybe today's the day that you need to start following Jesus. Even though you have questions, even though you have doubts, Jesus invites you, God invites you in in the midst of those things. He wants you to bring those things to him, and we want to help walk alongside you with that as you learn more about Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and if you don't know Jesus, let me just encourage you. Maybe you take this time to take a step. And if you decide to take that step for the first time, before you leave today, come talk to me. Come talk to somebody with a lanyard. We'd love just to celebrate with you. We'd love just to help you grow closer to Jesus and explain what this might look like. Uh, so let's pray.